Welcome, everybody. We are, of course, super excited to have Seth Godin with us today because he will be sharing his thoughts on nonprofits, resilience, and a chance to reset our strategy in just a moment. So before I introduce Seth formally, I'd like to quickly introduce myself and my partner at the Capital Campaign Toolkit. This is Andrea Kilstead. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, yes, and I'm Amy Eisenstein. And Andrea and I, of course, co-founded the Capital Campaign Toolkit as an alternative to traditional campaign consulting. The toolkit is completely virtual and empowers nonprofit leaders with the knowledge, the confidence, and the support they need to lead successful campaigns. And as a result of COVID-19, we're currently helping nonprofits raise emergency funds with goals of $100,000 or more in eight week mini campaigns. So as part of our mission to help empower nonprofit leaders, we're absolutely thrilled to be bringing you these weekly toolkit talks as you navigate through the changes and challenges that you're facing as a nonprofit leader. Okay. So now to the main attraction. Seth Godin probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, Seth is the author of 19 books that have been bestsellers around the world and translated into more than 35 languages. He's also the founder of the Alt MBA and the Akimbo Workshops, online seminars that have transformed the work of thousands of people. He writes about post-industrial revolution, the way ideas spread, marketing, quitting, leadership, and most of all, changing everything. Now, you're probably familiar with his books, including his latest book, This is Marketing, which was an instant bestseller around the world. His bio and his cred credentials go on and on, but most of you are here because you're already fans. So. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Seth, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks to both of you. Um, it's not easy to lead, and in this segment in particular, but the both of you have been showing up patiently and with generosity. So it's a, it's a privilege to talk to you again. You. All right, so here's how we're gonna work this today. Um, I'm going to begin by asking some questions to get us started, and Andrea is going to help monitor the chat and the Q&A boxes. Feel free, as we do every week, to use the chat box as a, a town hall format that we've set up, so feel free to share resources, talk to each other, uh, communicate, and the Q&A box, please use that specifically for questions that you hope Seth will answer. So. Um, I'm going to start, and then uh, in a little bit, we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. So feel free to start posting your questions now. So, Seth, we've got almost 700 people, nonprofit leaders, and fundraisers on the line and ready to learn. So, we're going to start out with today's topic, of course, nonprofit resilience and the chance to reset our strategy. Um, as you already acknowledged, in addition to the coronavirus crisis and the economic crisis we're facing, as if those weren't enough, uh, we need to also acknowledge, of course, the protests and the riots that are happening throughout the country. So with all of that in mind, uh, go ahead and get us started. What is your advice uh, for nonprofit leaders during this truly unprecedented time? Well, I'll just reiterate one little bit, which is, I see you, I hear you, I feel how disruptive this is. This is something that none of us prepared for and no one could expect. I don't have a two week tactical toolbox for you because there isn't one. And the thing is, we need to begin by understanding why we even have a strategy to begin with. Why not just run around and do tactics all day long? We need a strategy because the work our organization does is insufficient. What we need is a way to engage with other people who are ready to help us, who are ready to contribute to what we're doing with cash or with other things. And a strategy is necessary because humans aren't rational and they're not gonna look down a list of long-term thinking and say, I pick you. We need a strategy 
because the fact is that people only give money to a nonprofit when giving money to them is worth more than it costs to give them the money. In essence, everything we do when we are raising money is on sale. If someone's going to give us $100,000, it's because they get $200,000 or something else in return. So what do they get? It's not a tote bag. What they get is a feeling. What they get is status. What they get is connection. What they get is optimism. What they get is something that is aligned with what they want. And the thing that happens when crises occur is that we get confused about what we want. And so we hide. We retreat. We hope that it will just go away. We hunker down. In the workshops we've run, two kinds of people have been in them in the last three months. One kind of person has said to us, there's too much to worry about. There's too much news to watch. I need to defer. And the other kind of person has said, there's so much going on. I need to dive in even more deeply. And so you're not going to be able to hassle your way into raising emergency money because hassles are just more stress. Instead, you're going to need a strategy that says next week, the week after that, the week after that, as today's urgency fades and is replaced with tomorrow's urgency, who am I talking to and what am I bringing them where I am welcome? Because if you're not welcome, you're not going to raise nuisance money. You're going to have to figure out a strategy that makes it clear to the person there's no better bargain than supporting you and the work you're doing. Yeah. Talk, talk more a little, a little bit more about resetting a strategy, maybe some examples of actions that nonprofit leaders can take right now. And I think you're right on that some organizations have gone into freeze and hide and bury their heads kind of position and others are run, run, run. Um, so we would like everybody sort of to be somewhere in the middle and be thoughtful and strategic and planning and taking action. Um, so do you have any examples or, or more details that you can talk about that? Sure. I, I, a little bit about my background. I grew up in a really cool household. Uh, at the time, like all teenagers, I didn't realize how cool it was. Uh, my mom was the first woman on the board of the art museum in Buffalo. My dad was the volunteer head of the Studio Arena Theater and the volunteer head of the United Way one year. So I thought everybody grew up with parents like that. Uh, and I saw firsthand what it was to be part of a community and to help lead it. The thing is that when my dad broke the record at the United Way, he didn't do it by parading around people in need and saying to people who weren't in need, feel guilty. Um, there's this uh, form of fundraising that I refer to as National Lampoon Fundraising. The greatest magazine cover of all time is a dog on the cover of National Lampoon. And it says, buy this magazine or we'll shoot this dog. And there are settings where National Lampoon advertising works, but most nonprofits don't work in that space. And it gets old really fast because sooner or later people realize you're not gonna shoot the dog. And so it's not an effective tactic. But human beings, Americans, Americans with resources, want to feel like they're doing something. They don't want to feel like they're victims. They don't want to feel like they're simply waiting. They want to take action. And we need to begin by understanding that we don't need everyone to donate. That 10,000 donors would probably be a lot for anybody on this call. A thousand donors could change everything. Well, that's not a lot. That's almost nothing. By any rounding error, it's zero. That's all you need is zero. You know, my last, uh, book, which was one of my biggest bestsellers, sold to 0% of the population, if you round it down. Zero is enough. So how do you get to that? You get specific. You seek out the smallest viable audience, not the biggest possible audience. This smallest viable audience, what do they want? What do they seek? What matters to them? Because if you are viewing them as an ATM and you are a clerk, people can smell it on you. But if this person has a need to take action, and for them, action means a certain kind of thing, and you're the one who can provide that for them, they're going to be thrilled that you called them and disappointed if you don't. And so 
I can give you a hundred examples of organizations that have raised money or gotten people involved who would be really upset if they were left out, if you had your event and you didn't invite them. And so we have to get back to the core of this smallest viable group, this group of five people or 10 people or a hundred people. If they could have their dream come true, what is their dream? What do they want? Why does in this time of human disruption and pandemic, anyone support a zoological society? Well, someone does, and they do it for a really good reason. My guess is because they get a sense of control because they can do something about the fox habitat. They can't do anything about rushing a vaccine to market. Why does somebody in an era in which racial injustice is coming to the fore go ahead and invest in a nonprofit that doesn't work on that or does work on that? Either way, they're telling themselves a story. So our job as nonprofit fundraisers isn't to be the person who works for the important people at the nonprofit, the ones who do program. Our job is to influence program so that donors show up. Everybody works for you. Everybody in the organization works for you if you're in the, if you're in the fundraising side, because your job is to create an environment and program that matches the strategy, that applies to the smallest viable audience and helps you serve them by letting them give you money. Now, Seth, I don't know if you know, but what you're saying is music to our ears because that is exactly how capital campaign strategy works. Um, organizations have a big vision and a big dream and they go to their closest 20 donors who give ultimately 60, 70, 80, 90% of the campaign goal it's not about marketing to the masses. It's about gathering your tribe to steal one of your words and, uh, and communicating with them, with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, not marketing in the, in the mass sense, but, but really communicating with them on what, you, what you're passionate about, what you're committed to, what you hope to achieve. And it really isn't about getting to everybody. It's getting to those select few that, are, that can make a huge difference at your organization. All right, so the other part of our topic for today was about nonprofit leader resilience. So why don't you talk about resilience and what that means in today's? Okay, so some of this is gonna be a little difficult because sunk costs are real, but sunk costs must be ignored. What are sunk costs? Sunk costs are things you've earned, things you've bought, things you have from your old self that are given to your new self. And you don't have to take them if you don't want them. So if you have a law degree, it was hard to earn. But if 10 years after you became a lawyer, you hate being a lawyer, it's a sunk cost. Don't accept it. it. You don't need it going forward. You can move on. Now, in times of resilience, our enemy is leverage. Because if we weren't leveraged, we'd have enough in the bank, we'd have enough resources to soldier our way through to the other side. But if you are highly leveraged, if you built an institution that kept hiring people every time you got more money and kept building things every time you got a chance to do so, now you have maintenance costs. Now you have to keep it all going. And if you have to keep it all going, that's really hard to be resilient in the face of that. And it may make sense for the next six months for your organization to take a hard look at what you do and why you do it, why you signed up to do it in the first place and say, which of these things are we gonna live without now? Because we don't have a surplus anymore. And if we don't have a surplus anymore, how do we get back to first principles? So one of the, my particular hobby horses is every university should shut down their football program. There's just no way to justify having a football program if you're a university going forward. because the football program of 1965 wasn't funded the way it was funded today. There was just as much football, but it wasn't funded the same way. You could fund it bigger because you had a surplus. But now to keep it going, you're going to have to figure out what you're not going to fund. And the institution doesn't exist for football. The institution exists because of the student body and the way you chose to serve them. So that's the hard part. But then going forward, we can take a deep breath and we can say, all right, now that we know why we are here, the question is, who are we here for? 
which particular constituencies are at our core. How do we maintain what we do for them without being in the race to chase the other people who don't necessarily get the joke, the other people that we are supposed to be serving because other nonprofits like us serve them. So we're going to go chase them as well. And, you know, one of the things, my mom was the pioneer of the modern museum store and uh, she co-founded the museum store at the Albright Knox. And it used to break her heart because on Sundays, brides would come and get their picture taken on the picturesque steps leading up to the museum. And they would never step into the museum. And for months, it bothered her that they would come all this way, get their picture taken and never come in. And then she realized the museum wasn't for them and they weren't for the museum. And if all they needed was a picture, they can have a picture. But rather than racing around trying to find something brides wanted to come in and see, get back to first principles. What's our minimum viable audience? A group of people we have to serve, a group of donors who will help us serve them. And it turns out this reset can be a gift because you don't have to carry the cruft around anymore. You can take a deep breath and say, why did we even sign up to do this in the first place? How do we get back to why we are here? Yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting to uh, hear. I mean, I love that story about your mom and the museum. I think that that's spot on. I'm, I'm interested also to see the pushback that you get about football. Um, I mean, listen, as a former university fundraiser, I couldn't agree with you more. It made me really sick to my stomach when there were donors who cared more about the football than the education. But the question, you know, do we let the tail wag the dog at some of these institutions? But the reality is some of our donors care a lot about football. So I get uh, it. I'm just here to uh, promote. My, yes. <laughs> my opinion about football is irrelevant. If you got to, <laughs> to pay for the whole thing, you're serving everybody. Yeah. As you no, might imagine in the chat, you're getting lots of yays and nays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. So we're not going to go down the football rabbit hole. Um, so listen, Seth, you know, you come from a long line of philanthropists, a philanthropic family. That's amazing. And so I'm, I'm guessing you haven't mentioned your activity with nonprofits, but I'm guessing that either as a donor or a volunteer, that you're an active participant. So what types of communications are you hoping to hear from the nonprofits that you're involved with? What or what messaging are you encouraging them to, to share? Right. So um, this is a, a really important topic. Because either you are in the business of communicating at the retail level or communicating at the individual level. What it means to communicate at the retail level is that you have hundreds and hundreds of names in the email box, in the email list, or maybe thousands. And you do things you call blasts. And you use words like urgent. And you figure out how to put SEO into your emails and your calls. And you have this whole process of churn and burn. The other way to do it is to say, imagine I only have seven donors in the whole world. If I only had seven donors in the whole world, how would I contact this person? Because the odds that you would send a mass email to someone you had had a phone call with an hour ago are very, very low. So just because the tools are there for you to do mass at retail, that doesn't mean they're the tools you need. So let's look at uh, John Wood who built Room to Read through a $250 million charity from scratch in less than 10 years. How does John do that? He has a team of people in every city where they uh, fundraise, whose only job is to get the right eight people in the room. This is before the pandemic. That's it. Just get the right eight people in the room. Because if you get the right eight people in the room, when John shows up, he's going to leave with $500,000. Because he knows how to work a room with the right eight people in it so that everyone is eagerly trying to outdo the other. It's not a room I would ever set foot in. Eagerly outdo the other to see how much more they can sp spend than they do. Um, Sarah's name is John Wood, and the charity is Room to Read. Um, really worthy cause. But in that setting, he's not raising money the way a typical, I don't know, uh, campaign does of churn it, churn it, churn it, et cetera. There are other ways that have nothing to do with that that are done. So that if you look at what 
Scott has done at Charity Water, he's also raised a quarter of a billion dollars from scratch in 10 years. What does he do? He doesn't have a room. He only has two things. One, he says to people who are looking for status in social media, here is a way, a social media friendly way for somebody who has the means to spend $10,000 to $50,000 to speak up on our behalf that will help them achieve their status goals. And the second thing he has is an airplane. And he knows that if he gets you on the airplane to Ethiopia, you're going to become a member of the well and you're going to support what they are doing going forward. Again, I'm not the guy who's getting on the plane. That's not my thing. But that lever enables them to do what they do. The third one is my friend Jacqueline Novogratz, who started Acumen. Acumen is now 20 years old. They've raised over $100 million. They've impacted the lives of 200 million people who make less than $5 a day. That's an extraordinary thing to be able to say. And when Jacqueline says, will you come to India with me because we need you to help these three organizations, I can say instant yes, because that is what I need. I need to know that I'm not one of 50 people with a checkbook. I'm just somebody who can show up and do something in addition to that. Different people are gonna want something different from the communication. But if you're treating everyone the same, except substituting first bracket bracket in an email, don't be surprised that they treat you the same as everybody else is doing that to them. And what does this mean? It means that if you're gonna do $50 fundraising, $100 fundraising, you can't do it as a pretending that you're doing $100,000 fundraising. It's gotta be a different thing. It's gotta be significantly more transactional on purpose. You've gotta say, we know that this is in and out and you know it too. And that has to be a benefit to that. And there's plenty of examples of that. And that's the tote bag. And there's nothing wrong with the tote bag because if someone thinks the tote bag is worth more than a hundred bucks, they're going to buy the tote bag when you do pledge week. All right, Seth, I was going to wait till a little bit later, but you brought it up. Uh, Jacqueline's book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to a Better World, to Build a Better World, I'm sorry. And so uh, at your recommendation, we are going to give away to 125 people participating on the call today a copy of Jacqueline's new book. And so I wanted to, you know, let people remind people to look in their inbox in their email box after this call, you'll be uh, notified if you're a winner um, of the book or a recipient of a free copy of the book. So, um, so Seth, why don't you tell us what you love about the manifesto for a moral revolution? Why do you recommend this book and, and what, 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 what do you take away is? Well, I'm so thrilled that you're sharing this. The, what is the idea of moral imagination? I think lots of people are very comfortable with financial imagination. They're comfortable with sports achievement imagination. They're comfortable with social imagination. How do I make it more of X, Y, or Z? But in this line of work, what we really need is a moral imagination. And the moral imagination is, what could I do to make things better? I'm not a cog in the fundraising machine. I am actually an independent agent who could make something better. Nathan Winograd, who was the father of the no-kill shelter movement, uh, there are literally 40 million dogs and cats that are alive today because of Nathan Winograd. When he got to the first shelter, he started from scratch uh, in, in Ithaca, New York. The day he got there, uh, there was a guy in the parking lot dropping off six little kittens. And he walked in and the staff, which was overworked and understandably bureaucratic said, yep, we're just gonna have to kill those too because the entire mindset of the shelter community had been, this is a machine, there's too much inbound, there aren't enough resources. And Nathan stood there and he called people into the parking lot and he said, why not? Why don't we just reestablish a standard? Why not just make things the way we could imagine they would be? And from that day forward, they'd never killed another dog or cat. It wasn't on the table. It wasn't allowed. And Nathan had to invent all this stuff that just is unreasonable to do in order to keep his promise. But that's an example of the moral imagination. 
And so when Acumen shows up with an organization like Water Health to bring clean water to a village that's never had it, um, or the Vision Spring movement to get eyeglasses to people who don't have them. These are things that are not impossible. They're just extraordinarily difficult. And they're not easy to raise money for. It's just extraordinarily difficult. But that's when the moral imagination is so important, is because it's our job being close to the front to say, I see that this is possible. Now, how am I going to tell this story to someone who once they hear the story can't go to bed tonight until they call me back? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the challenges that I think the entire nonprofit sector faces, some more than others, is that we're trying to challenge or to solve really difficult challenges like eliminating hunger or homelessness or poverty along the same lines or illiteracy um, the, or curing diseases, right? There are huge issues that the nonprofit sector is, is tackling. And so what this crisis has done for us, I think, um, in, all, in addition to everything negative, is provided an opportunity to flip everything on its head and really challenge us to think about how can we serve in a totally different way, in a way that we've never considered before. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that you're talking about. You want to say anything else about that before we start heading over to uh, some of the questions that have I, been I do. I have, I have one last micro rant on this, which is... yeah. <laughs> you know, some people have complained that this is one of the only fields where the word non is the first word of what you do. I, I embrace this idea, nonprofit. Why do we give you a tax break? We give you a tax break because we don't know the answer to the problem you're trying to solve. If we did, we would have solved it already. That the very nature of the work you do is it's on spec. You can't be sure. And so if you go to a donor and say, give us this money and we won't shoot the dog, but we will solve world hunger, they're not going to believe you because you can't be sure. But what you can say is you're the kind of person who cares enough to try. We're going to try to solve this problem. We're going to do it in a transparent way. We're going to do it in a way where we're going to tell all our competitors our secrets so they can do it even more so. We're going to apply a level of commitment and passion to solving an impossible problem because someone like you cares enough to do that because it's not for profit and it's not the market. If the market could have solved this problem, it would have. But you're the kind of person that wants to at least do something you know the effort will occur. That's what we're here to do. And that's why we're called a nonprofit. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we're going to turn it over to Andrea, who's going to, who's been monitoring the questions that are popping up in the question box. So another, a little bit of good news is that in during this crisis is we're seeing an outpouring of generosity, really, to support those affected by this crisis. So what can nonprofit leaders do to stand out in the crowd, uh, in the sea of communication that is happening and, and the calls for help, honestly? Yeah. So there are some people who want to hear that you are going down for the third time and that you're drowning. That's what they've been waiting for. Because if they weren't, they would have donated already. If that is the person you are seeking, then that's what you got to do. But if you are in a sea and a crowd, you've already made the first mistake. That the answer is not to use channels that are filled to the top because they're easy to get in. The answer is to use channels that are hard to get in, to figure out how to have a different kind of interaction with a different kind of person for a different reason. And the key is no one cares about you. No one cares about your emergency. No one cares about your sunk costs. They just don't, particularly now when so many people are feeling completely untethered. That what they care about is finding their footing, putting their feet on the ground, figuring out how to get to where they want to go. And if you can find a story, a true story, that helps them get where they want to go, then they will gladly come with you. And that is the key. It, it, you know, the fact that your board is giving you a hard time, they don't care. 
Great. Uh, so true. So true. All right, Andrea, we're going to take a 30 second seven in, seventh inning stretch, literally or figuratively. If you want to stretch, go right ahead, you know. Um, and uh, Andrea is going to pick out a question or two, or hopefully we'll get to 10 that we're going to get Seth to answer. Um, but we just want to remind you that one of the things that we're doing at the Capital Campaign Toolkit to help nonprofits in this time of crisis. One is these weekly toolkit talks. And the second one is if you want a free strategy call with us to discuss your capital campaign or your emergency fundraising, um, just go to the Capital Campaign Toolkit homepage and you can sign up for a pivot, pivot session uh, with us to for free to talk about your fundraising strategy, emergency fundraising, or your capital campaign. So. All right, Andrea, over to the questions from the crowd. Thank you. Uh, first of all, there are for, some of you have written in questions specifically about capital campaigns. And for those, I encourage you to go to our homepage and sign up for a session. Amy and I will be happy to talk to you about that. I don't think Seth is really here to talk specifically about capital campaigns. However, Seth, I have the first question for you. People want to know what your 205 cup is. Oh. Um, <laughs> I have, as you can tell, a lot of patina in my office. The patina has a patina. And uh, I have a lot of mugs, but this was a company that promised to send you a random number on any mug. So I bought four. Each was random. It's just the biggest one. So if I know I'm sitting with you, I don't want to have to get up in the middle and get a refill. I just grab the biggest one. Yeah, okay, great. I thought they would get us. Get I, need a better, I need a better story than that for sure. <laughs> All right. Now there are a number. There are lots of questions that have been coming in. Let me let me sort of take some of them and add my own to that. Um, as you well know, nonprofits are complicated, right? You have a mission, an executive director, a board, an advisory board, a history, an alumni. This, these are complicated organizations. Yeah. We have, as you have so articulately said, a, an amazing opportunity to rethink what we're doing, why we're doing it, what matters, what's important. How do we combine those two, having a complicated organization of lots of stakeholders with multiple directions and a wonderful opportunity? How would you think about that? Well, I think that the sign of being a professional is you have your emergency before the market forces you to. And that being able to see eight weeks into the future and holding your breath for a miracle doesn't work because if the miracle doesn't show up, then you're gonna make bad decisions at the last minute. And instead, realizing that the world has fundamentally changed, that movie theaters aren't gonna be full for a really long time, probably ever. Because even if we all start taking a vaccine, the movie industry has been changed forever. So if your whole business was, I'm picking in one intentionally irrelevant, if your entire business was based on that, now is the time to deal with it, not, when you've run out of money. And so figuring out how to tell that story in a way that gets the key people to be on side with you so that they can tell the story to the next people, that lets you start having proactive conversations. I don't believe klaxons and sirens are the way professional organizations should make choices. And you know, I don't do humanitarian work for a living but I'll give you an example from my life. I spent, I, I invented commercial email all those years ago. And the organization I built around it, Yo-Yo Dine, grew pretty regularly until we had AOL as our biggest customer. And they hired us to build this chat engine that was gonna change everything. And we invested a million dollars we didn't have in building this thing because it was gonna be so lucrative. And two days before it came out, AOL changed their business model from royalties, to it's a flat fee per month. So suddenly our 30% royalty was gonna be worth zero forever. I couldn't change AOL's mind. It wasn't my fault that AOL changed it. They changed it, that's the way it was. So I didn't say, let's just keep building the chat engine until we go bankrupt. That didn't make any sense. So you say, well, we have a window. We have a little bit of resources. I'm gonna to have to shut some things down. And we didn't have to lay off one person but that's only because I did it before the last minute. And so I think getting the director, getting people who are on the board, people who are ready to make hard decisions, to make them before it's an emergency, that's the hallmark of an organization that's here for the right reason. Thank you. 
So Ellen Brown has asked an interesting question of me and of you and of everyone, really. And it's a question that we think about some in the capital campaign world, which, as you may know, focuses on a very few, very small number of donors who give it a high, at a high level. And Ellen's question is this. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you imagine a fundraising strategy that involves and engages people who can support at a small scale? Doesn't the focus on finding a small number of people further concentrate power and create an asymmetric understanding of both problems and solutions? It's this question of whether you put the power in the- I think we have to understand what small means, right? How many people write Wikipedia? Wikipedia, the fourth busiest website in the world, the one that has ended many industries has more than half a million people who have made an edit of a typo or something like a typo. But only 4,000 people have edited all of Wikipedia in any substantial way. Only 4,000. That's what I mean by a smallest viable number. It's not how many zeros you have. It's just realizing there's different kinds of people. And so if we look you know, at the long shot extraordinary success that Bernie Sanders has had. Whether or not you agree with his politics, his personality, the state he's from, given all the check boxes that he walked into the race with to come as far as he did, how did he do that? He had a whole bunch of people who would throw 50 bucks anytime he asked. How many people? Not that many. Less than a million. That's enough. Whereas most people who run are talking to Super Bowl sized audiences and expecting a miracle doesn't happen. You need a small group, and that small doesn't have to be eight or 4,000, but you better know the name of each one of those people and why they're in it. And you need, you know, you pick your donors, you pick your future. If the donors you have picked are people who only donate if it's an emergency or if there is a gun to the dog's head, you've just described your future. I don't think you should pick donors like that. I think you should fire donors like that, send them to someone else, and go find the donors who are there for the reason you're there. Yes, I love the idea of firing donors. And there are donors who should be fired. I have to say that that I totally agree with that. <laughs> I bet, I'll bet most many people on this call have never thought about firing their donors. So that, that's a good one for me. So uh, Jen Verschragen has asked this question. Um, how do you reconcile the idea of, of don't parade people in need, right? And there is something to that with the ability to demonstrate urgency and need. Right, okay, so again, if your donors are donating because there's an urgent problem, how are you going to persuade them that it's urgent? What does that even look like? And what we learned from the Live Aid concert is that it is possible to find truly pathetic imagery and that imagery sticks with me, I don't know, 30 years later. But when we think about what drives people to actually send money. It's almost always about what will my mom think of what I did? What will my friends and peers think of what I did? And what will I think about what I did? Because a pathetic image can get $10 from somebody, but it doesn't cause them to define themselves. We define ourselves by people like us do things like this. And if you want to remember this graphically, it's pretty simple. Lots of people have a Harley Davidson tattoo and almost no one has a Suzuki tattoo because Suzuki makes motorcycles and Harley Davidson makes a lifestyle. And you don't have to show someone a carburetor to get them on the Harley Davidson bandwagon. They do it because people like us do things like this. Yeah, and then following up on that, Elizabeth Smith has asked us, and it's just a simple, wonderful question. How do we find our tribe? Or what's the best way to find a tribe if we're really small? Right. Okay, so almost none of us have a tribe. I don't have a tribe. There are groups of people who will let us narrate for them. And that's different. And so you find a group of people that needs to be led, that needs to be connected, right? So TED, the conference, doesn't have a tribe as much as there is a group of itinerant upper income elites who wanted to be with each other and engage with interesting ideas. And Ted showed up to say, I will lead you, follow me. And so the chance we have is to find naturally occurring connections in our universe and be there 
for them, the connector of them. And then that establishes it. So, um, well, I'll, I want to answer a lot of questions, so I won't tell another story about this, but keep going. Well, and there are more questions about tribes. If we're a national organization, how do we find a tribe, right? If we're a teeny organization, how do we find a tribe? If we're a huge organization, how do we find right. it? Oh, no, Seth, tell your stories. People love your stories. Don't <laughs> stop. So the short version is uh, the, the town I live in has great public schools. And I know Brian is here from Andrus, which is right down the street. Uh, one of them won a Blue Ribbon Award from the Department of Education years ago. It's only two schools in the whole town. And uh, we lost the school board budget in New York State. If you lose twice, you're in really big trouble. And a few people got together and one time hung blue ribbons from the big tree in front of the high school on a week and a half before the second vote. And that's all they did. And over the next week, blue ribbons started sprouting up all around the town until at the revote, we won two to one after having lost two to one in the first vote. And the difference was people like us support schools like this. The blue ribbons are right there in front of your house. You're the kind of person that supports this. And so part of the challenge that a giant American Cancer Society, American Heart Association has is that many of their donors don't donate more than once and don't seek to be identified as lifetime donors to this. They were simply honoring the memory of someone who got sick and turning that person into someone who says, the way I see myself when I look in the mirror is as a supporter of this is a wholesale shift in so much of what you need to do because you're shifting from retail to personal and that's doable, but you have to do it on purpose. It's just not going to happen. Most nonprofits that don't spend a lot of time on their strategy end up doing the easiest fundraising to get into. And that tends to be crisis at retail, low dollar, low dollar, or friends of my mother-in-law who I could cajole, but then they, it stalls. And the organizations that move on to be at a much bigger scale don't have that many more donors, but they're very strategic about why those people are donors in the first place. They're making it so that a tribe wants to be part of what they're doing. Yes, uh, you know, that, that raises, I've, ra there are a number of questions and we often get them about donor fatigue. And yeah. here it's framed in another way. If you have a tribe, don't you run the risk of oversaturation with them, right? It's, it's, it's right, the question. And, and, and Wendy, that's a great question. Um, why don't you go ask a Star Trek person that question? Are there too many Star Trek movies? No, there aren't because they're not feeling oversaturated because no one's taking anything from them. They're being given something. They're being given a chance to be part of something. That's all we want. And so, yeah, my grandfather was a successful fundraiser and he quit because they put him in the uncomfortable position of manipulating his neighbors, using status roles to get them to outbid each other to, to raise money in Mount Vernon, New York, where he used to live. That's fatigue because no one left that dinner feeling better than when they went. And that was selfish of the organization. Whereas there are lots of things that we do, whether it's going to your spiritual institution once a week or tuning into that thing you're binge watching where you feel like you're a part of something and you would be disappointed that they didn't film the last episode of The Queen because it's not about being oversaturated, it's being underserved. That's the way you need to feel. Yes, it's, it's interesting to think about how, how people, how organizations can use the current crisis to, to engage some of their donors in a more real way as they rethink what it is they should be doing. Right. Because the, the thing that's worth noting is the 20 million richest people in America all have more resources than the last King of France did. That this is a truly wealthy community of people in a period of time when the world is in complete disarray, but not about to get blown up in a nuclear war. And in that moment, what are the resources even for? What are they for if you aren't in debt and about to lose your house? Well, they're for finding peace of mind. And there are lots of ways people seek peace of mind. 
And if you can offer somebody a path toward peace of mind, they're not going to feel oversaturated. Seth, we have a wonderful question here from Karen, and I think it's a question that's particularly timely today with the racial unrest and the, and the challenges we face as a country. And Karen says, how can diversity and equity happen if you're relying on a developing your tribe? It seems a bit of a closed club, perhaps. Okay, so there's no doubt that people have misused uh, for their own gain some of the ideas in tribes to divide us. That's not what I meant when I wrote the book, and it's not what's possible. I believe tribes are not, whether you're left-handed or right-handed, or black or white, I think that tribes are a point of view, a posture. People like us do things like this, but people like us doesn't mean what you look like. It's what you believe, what you dream of, what you want. And so, diversity. Scott Page's brilliant books on this make it clear. Diversity pays for itself. If you've ever listened to uh, the Tucson Clarinet Orchestra, which is 90 clarinets all playing Shostakovich, oh, that's right, there's no such thing. There are no clarinet orchestras because clarinets don't work well if they're all one instrument. To make an orchestra, we need a diversity of instruments because we are all solving different problems together. So diversity makes enormous amounts of sense. Diversity of outlook, diversity of background, diversity of appearance, diversity of income, but you still got to get to what's this institution for? What change are we trying to make? Who are we seeking to serve? And you should enlist the people whose point of view and background and belief system helps you solve the problem, not just so that you have checked whatever guilt you have at the door. So yeah, diversity is optimal and it's essential and you're going to get it by actively going where people who have those attributes hang out. You can't wait for them to show up at your door. You've got to go get them. And what I'm arguing for is don't try to change the minds of people who aren't open to hearing what you have to say. You don't have enough leverage. You don't have enough time. That I am never going to get somebody who doesn't speak English to read the English edition of one of my books. I can't do it. They're not interested. Fine. There are enough people who are. And you can then do the hard work of finding someone who is open to where you are going, but doesn't look or act or feel or believe what you believe, but still wants to go where you're going. That's called leadership. Yes, you know, if you look at, the, uh, at, at board membership, and particularly board membership of foundations, what you find is a group that is not particularly diverse. They are diverse only in many, only in name only. Right. I think it turns out to be a fairly challenging, um, challenging shift for many organizations to make, particularly when they go to it with the idea that board members should be wealthy right. and should control wealth, right? And the minute we start stepping away from that, right, all kinds of challenges come up. I wonder if you would speak to that. Right. So there is totally a place for exchanging cash for status, that having a board where the expectation is you get status from being on this board and the cost of it is cash, I think it's a very useful tactic. I can't argue against it. But don't ask that board for advice because that's not why you picked them. You picked them so you could trade status for cash. You should have a different board to ask for advice who are there because they have attitude, because they have belief, because they have knowledge. And that is open to everybody regardless of background. And you should go actively recruit people to be on that board. So let's just get our terms right before we get into a kerfuffle. You know, the same thing's true with foundations. Most foundation boards at scale, the board members aren't actually doing a lot of work. And you should make sure that the people who are doing work represent a diversity of background and opinion. Yeah, Andrea, I wanna to get to Nikki's question. Uh, she says, since we're offering free virtual programs in lieu of our typical paid on-person programs, some donors are assuming we don't need funds because we're not traveling, using as many supplies, renting spaces. Um, we know that donors don't want to support overhead, that negative you know, word in nonprofit fundraising. Uh, and so how can we, how uh, 
can we get them to better understand the program development aspect and expenses of shifting our offerings? You know, what are your thoughts on the overhead issue in general? Right. So the overhead issue is a great uh, example of two symptoms. The first one, which we've talked about, is if you've trained your donors to only give you money when there is an obvious program emergency, don't be surprised that when you ask for money, they're going to say, where's the program emergency? And they're going to say, I don't like overhead, because that's what you train them to say. And then the second half of it is that your donors don't know nearly as much about your organization as you do. They don't know anything about what you're confronting the way you do. Don't assume that they do, but they know what's going on inside their head way more than you do. And so when you go to them and say, we need money to do this program, this program, this program, and it works, it's because they can tell their friends and spouse, yeah, this program's named after us, or this program's happening because I participated. Well, you can tell them just as much of a status story about what does it mean to be the thoughtful, long-term strategic thinker who only funds overhead. And this is one of the things that Scott did that was so brilliant at Charity Water. So if you join the well, what you do is you commit to paying him some money every month and he only spends the money you give on overhead. And as a result, 100% of every other penny they raise at retail they can say 100% goes straight to digging a well for somebody in Ethiopia, which gives them more leverage in their fundraising and on and on and on and on. So as a member of the well, that gives me a really perverse sort of pride. I'm not foolish enough to be tricked by program. I'm the kind of person that can fund overhead. Aren't I smart? And that's a storytelling tool. And it's one that we can use to help the person who's giving us money get what they want. Because what they want isn't wells in Ethiopia. What they want is the way it makes them feel when there are wells in Ethiopia. So Rich Quinn's asked this, uh, building a tribe, uh, can building a tribe happen in a group setting or do you need to do it one by one? Well, sooner or later, it has to happen in a group setting, right? Um, so Fast Company Magazine, when it was started, Alan and Bill, uh, who had come from junior positions at the Harvard Business Review, didn't really know the people they needed to know. And so they invited 60 of us to a advance, the opposite of a retreat. And uh, I made two of my best friends in the world at that first one. I didn't know many people when I got there, I just knew them by reputation. And I was so honored to be included that I went. And they got a huge benefit out of being able to assemble this circle of 60 people who kept coming together to help influence what they were doing. And I got even more out of it because I got invited Groucho Marx style to a club that I wish I'd been a member to. And uh, you can't do that anymore in person, not for a while, but guess what? It's now you've got this great excuse to do it digitally, which means instead of persuading me to fly to Wyoming, you just got to persuade me to hang out with 20 people I've always wanted to hang out with in a digital setting. Don't use it as an excuse to hit me up for money. Use it as an excuse to make me part of a circle. Because once we're all in the circle, we're going to look at the center of the donut and say, oh, how can we help you, Andrea? Because this circle we're in, this matters to us. You know, Seth, for years now, you have used the digital, digital platforms as a way of training people and teaching people and communicating with people. Now that many nonprofits are thrown into that pot, perhaps the, for the first time. What advice do you have for them about how to make best use of it? Well, particularly the universities are breaking my heart because after poo-pooing and ignoring folks like me who've been doing this for a decade, they're showing up with really below average stuff and proclaiming that uh, it's good. And then the minute they can stop using it, they'll go back. And I think that they're underserving people. The thing is that to pick museums, Museums have had a thousand years to figure out how to make a museum a great experience. And it is not unusual to spend a lot of money and time to get somebody, a curator, et cetera, to make your museum experience even better. So please don't think that just because you can get a Zoom room for free, you know how to do it because you don't. And going in with the humility to say, there are people who are better at this than I am. 
what can I steal? I'm all for it. And I've been really clear from the beginning of Akimbo and before that, steal what I do, please. I'll make mistakes so you can do better. And it doesn't make sense to just slam a bunch of people in a Zoom, Zoom room and believe you've replaced something that took you decades to figure out how to do. What are three things you've learned from Akimbo that you would encourage our nonprofit world to, to, to steal? So the two conceptual ones are people have two big problems. Number one, they don't trust you. They don't trust you to keep your promises. They don't trust you to leave them alone. They don't trust you to uh, do everything that they hope. And the second thing, which is much bigger, is they don't trust themselves. They don't trust themselves to level up. They don't trust themselves to act like someone who has uh, a surplus. They don't trust themselves to play in a bigger arena. And those two pieces of trust are really important. And from a digital point of view, what I've learned is that piping a speech into a Zoom room wastes everybody's time. And that real learning happens when we do something. That's how you learn to ride a bike. It's how you learn to walk. And so when we use Zoom, it's breakout rooms. It's a lot of people talking to one another. Uh, the discourse uh, platform we use, we get 100,000 page views every month when there's only 300 people in the workshop. Workshops, deep interactivity, that's the answer. I went to an advisory board meeting last week. It was not worth me going. They should have just sent me a memo. And if you can send a memo, you should send a memo because we don't have to do everything in real time anymore. Well, and isn't that really also the answer to the question of how we how we invite our board members or advisory board members or staff members to relook at what we are doing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. That we open this. up to them the So let if you've ever played Monopoly, a game I used to like and now I hate. Community chest. Community chest is ridiculous because what it says to us is Mr. Moneybags made all this money and now he's giving it to the nonprofit and the nonprofit is pushed to act like a factory. The nonprofit is pushed to be a compliance focused, scalable industrial entity that has reliable outputs. And there are certain areas where we need that, right? We need that if we want to build a lot of homeless housing in a short period of time. Please give me a factory. But the rest of the time, it's a lab. It's a lab. Your job is to publish your work, figure out what works, steal what you can from other people and then publish something else. You're doing science, you're not doing industry. And science is not about compliance. It is a studio. It is people who care enough to speak up and to fail again and again, to take responsibility and not worry about authority. That's why we have nonprofits. And so stop trying to act in the image of Andrew Carnegie or Henry Ford and instead say, we're going to build something because we can, and we're going to exert our moral imagination, not try to industrialize this and scale it. So listen, that hour flew by. Uh, so many people in the chat have asked if we're recording this, if we're sharing it, the answer is yes. Uh, we'll send the link tomorrow when we send our, blog, our weekly blog post. We will be continuing the conversation uh, on the blog tomorrow, so feel free to check in for that. Seth, final key takeaways, words of wisdom. What do you want to leave everybody with? I'm the president of your fan club, each and every one of you 700 people. This work that you're doing in hard times and not hard times, it's vital. It's vital because our goal is not to die with as much money as possible. Our goal is to make a difference. And you're the soft tissue that lets us make a difference. So thank you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it so much. Seth Godin, thank you, thank you, thank you. Go make a record. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being here. Bye, Seth.